Time to time I like to look around junk shops and I'm always on the lookout for old chairs but so actually you can learn a lot by looking at an old chair and here's one I got down in Hastings um, eight pounds it's a rather sorry state but it's a lovely simple sort of country kitchen chair and I guess it's dated it's round about 1860 the chair of this exact model does appear on Edwin Scull's uh, broadsheets for the chairs that he made so it could be one of his, it, it could be one of the other numerous factories. I mean, it's a typical Wickham chair, high Wickham chair, because it's got the three bead high Wickham turnings on the legs, and they're replicated very nicely on the uprights here in the same, so it's like the leg reversed. You've got the three Wickham bead turnings, and then the single turning. On the legs, the same, the three Wickham bead with a single turning. The legs and these upright poles are all hand cleft wood. That is, someone's gone into the woods, a bodger's gone into the woods, cut down a tree, split it up, and then turned all of these on the pole lathe. And the reason I know that is, first of all, the grain follows right the way through from the top to the bottom, so it makes a very strong leg. It's been split out of a log in short, so the splits follow the grain. And the other reason for that is that the legs are actually oval in sort of cross section so they're fatter one way than the other way and that's because as the wood's dried it shrunk and it shrinks more one way than the other so it's actually oval. So these were made by bodgers in the woods. They were paid for a pittance for turning lots and lots of legs and um, they just did them all on a pole lathe in situ in the wood and they would get really fast at turning legs like this use very few tools, use their pole lathe and um, they'd be paid by the quantity they produce so it was piecework really, early form of piecework and this chair was then probably assembled in the factory the seat is elm um, about an inch and three eighths thick so it's actually quite a thin seat it could well have been hollowed out by a machine adze uh, might have been a hand one but there's no, it's so regular in appearance it was quite possibly just done with a machine adze and there's actually one of these in Stuart Linford's workshops in High Wycombe, an old-fashioned machine adze around about the 1860s the power machines started to come in the back spindles are machine made because the grain runs straight out the sides they're actually a lot weaker than a proper cleft spindles in earlier chairs the back's been bandsawn. It's actually on the back of it, it's got bandsaw marks. It was obviously painted at some stage because underneath there's evidence of old paint residue. And all over its surface, across the seat there, there are burn marks. So someone's clearly gone at this with a hot air gun or a blow lamp to try to get all the paint off. And in the process, they've actually singed all the wood. So all the seat there is singed. And all these spindles here, stretchers and legs are also got quite definite burn marks on them where they obviously held a blow lamp or the hot air gun far too long to get the paint off. It must have been quite difficult getting the paint out of the seat. Being elm it's got quite a deep coarse grain so that would have been more tricky. What I particularly like about this chair is the generous sort of proportions and ratios on the leg. There are nice big bold turnings here for the Wiccan beads and it goes nicely in and out on the leg arm here and it's been replicated up here which really makes for a very attractive sort of balance of symmetry in a very simple country chair. The legs of this chair are made of beech and you can see how in the earlier days it had been coloured red because there's um, a sort of deep, make, probably to make it look like a mahogany colour to make the beech which we now nowadays might regard as quite a nice quality wood um, back in Victorian times people probably would rather look down on beach and um, would want to dress it up to make it look more like mahogany and that's really what they've done here because there's sort of evidence of old treacly type stained varnish where this chair would have been dipped into a big tank and just coated in a like a lacquer which would give it a ready hue it's kept between the turnings where obviously the blow lamping and the stripping hasn't got the residue out the other perhaps interesting thing to notice with the legs is that they're very symmetrical in terms of their splay. If you look at most older chairs, you'll have one leg slightly out 
compared to another, and not at the same angle, and that's because they've been bored by hand. I suspect this one's been bored with a machine. I mean, by the sort of 1860s, power in the factories and seat boring machines, which would automatically bore the leg angles at the right depth and at the right splay, were becoming quite commonplace in a larger factory. So I suspect this was bored by machine as well. The joints going into the seat um, are only an inch in diameter and they're blind jointed so the joints don't go right through the whole of the seat they just go in to like halfway and the joints on the spin on the stretchers here are also um, they're five eighths of an inch so quite nice and slender taking advantage of the strength of the cleft wood in fact you get away with a sort of narrow diameter join without any risk of breakage and really it's a great lesson in economy of wood the whole chair the way it's been made is actually quite a small chair I mean by today's standards I could sit in this chair and I'd sort of cover it it would be quite comfortable for me I'm six foot one if one of my sons were to sit on this they're larger boned and six foot five they would actually find it too small and it really just shows how going back a few generations people were smaller and if that's the case with this chair, you certainly wouldn't make one quite so small today.